so this talk was originally uh, best practices of serverless. This week I've had a chance to talk to a number of people who kind of have helped me kind of rethink of what serverless really is in the future of serverless. And so last night I rewrote my entire talk. So this is, uh, I wrote this about midnight last night and completely redid it from uh, serverless best practices to be the future of serverless. Uh, and the reason I did that is because I feel like what we're talking about today of serverless is a very limited view of serverless. Uh, you know, the panel last night, there was, you know, some pretty scathing remarks against serverless, quite some uh, colored commentary uh, that was pretty interesting. So really, if we look at what serverless is today, it's really about fully matched services, right? And it, from, you know, like application runtimes to databases to security, these runtimes that completely encapsulate everything we need to do something like run, a, you know, like a Java function. Or there's Google BigQuery that has everything I need to query a database and, you know, process the results. So this is all, all about, you know, offloading the management of these server tasks to the cloud provider. And the focus is really on the ease of operation development today. Uh, so the current value of serverless, I, I personally, you know, if I was on the panel, I would wait in, you know, there's some value in serverless today. I think beyond just this ease of running and deploying application, uh, there's a number of areas where it's really useful. One is in, in security with the least privilege approach, right? If I have a cloud function and I only give it access to a single database, if that cloud function gets, you know, attacked, I'm going to minimize the blast radius of my services. So I think there's a lot of value to serverless in the security space. Uh, Netflix uses a, they call it the trough. I don't know if I spelled trough right. But right, what they have is this ability to scale down their services and make the resources available for um, things like running machine learning models. So at night or off peak hours, they can take the excess resources and do such things such as video codex processing. So this ability to kind of balance my workloads across the servers is very useful. Um, I also think there's a lot of value in serverless with the, the Graal VM. There's talks yesterday. Jason gave a great talk yesterday about the Graal VM, you know, and how it optimizes cold starts and image sizes, improves runtime performance. So what should serverless be? That's where we're at today. It's, it, today we're really focused on this ease of development and operation. I think the f f one of the few, uh, really the focus going forward is going to be not only on this ease of development operation, but also on the economic models around serverless. So it goes beyond this ease of operation to how we can optimize our billing models. Uh, so really, this, this word serverless is becoming so overloaded, meaning so many things. I think we're going to, at some point, someone will come up with a better name for serverless. But really, it's about this, um, more than abstracting over servers, it's about this, you know, James Ward said last night, you know, a model that matches supply with demand. So, depending on how much compute I need, that demand is automatically met for me. And I don't think about how those resources are provided or how they get allocated. Uh, the other way of thinking about this, there's, an, there's a really interesting paper on this, uh, the Berkeley View of Serverless Computing, where I want to decouple co computation and storage, which is already, most cloud providers already do this, but not only do I decouple the computation and storage, I also provision and price them independently. So my storage gets priced independent from how my compute gets priced. So there's, this opens up some really interesting possibilities for new avenues of, uh, you know, building and, and, you know, economic resource, uh, you know, the economic models behind computing. And really what it comes down to is, uh, I think the key of serverless in the future is going to be, why I want to pay in proportion to the resources used instead of the resources allocated. So, you know, today when I spin up a Kubernetes cluster, I say the node sizes and how much compute I want. Whenever I'm having to specify the amount of compute I want ahead of time, I'm having to pay for those resources ahead of time. And so, you know, today there are, you know, like lambdas, those kinds of things, you know, bill per, uh, you know, like the 100 millisecond marks. But as that billing model s expands across the stack, I think that's where serverless is going to go in being able to bill for my resources allocated across the entire stack, you know, in terms of the storage layers, all the different layers. <coughs> There's a fundamental Achilles heel in a serverless today, though. And that is, um, there's this, this major, I think, um, you know, hurdle to get, having serverless being adopted today. And the, the, there's a, one of these challenges is it's almost impossible to auto-scale your data store. So if you're familiar with Cassandra, like the Cassandra is, I mean, I, I love Cassandra. It's an amazing database. 
but it doesn't, I can't auto scale like Cassandra. I can't, you know, add five nodes, you know, for an hour and then scale that back down to three nodes. It's impossible to auto scale like Cassandra, you know, Elasticash, Redis. I have to pre allocate pretty much the number of nodes I want in my compute resource. So this makes it really challenging to meet these flexible uh, billing models where I can scale to zero when I'm not using something. Uh, so, you know, these pricing models don't truly line up with the, uh, the models of these back end services yet today. Um, Another thing, if we look at the, the primary hurdles of serverless, is if we look at the use cases where it's being, you know, where it's really useful, um, parallel processing of tasks, low traffic applications, stateless web applications, right, um, job scheduling, these kinds of use cases, this is where I think the sweet spot of serverless is today. But if you look at all these, they have a common thread that that's their primarily stateless. So this is where serverless is today, is on these type of stateless applications, which leads a major gap because I'm limited to how I can use my functions, my serverless functions. So what has happened is uh, serverless has become anonymous with stateless functions. So, you know, in last night's panel, you know, Jesse made that comment that, you know, until we have, you know, extremely low latency access to, you know, storage, and from a serverless function, we're never going to be able to achieve state. And this is the primary problem that we're facing today, is serverless is equated with stateful functions. Yeah, go ahead. Did you mean synonymous? Synonymous, thank you. Synonymous with stateless functions. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to have an autocorrect in the audience. I appreciate that. <laughs> So the, when we look at the, the serverless today, um, some of the common limitations are the functions are primarily stateless. They're, they're ephemeral, short-lived, right? It's, and the problem is, is that when they're this very ephemeral, short-lived kind of function, it gets very expensive to, to lose my computational context and rehydrate. You know, if I'm in the process of video codec, you know, doing a video codex, and I lose that process in the middle of it, and I have to restart from the beginning, I've lost all my state. Uh, you know, machine learning models, you know, if I'm trained in a machine learning model, I lose my state halfway through the training, I've lost a lot of the, the, the processing, the comp so all that context gets lost. Um, another really pro big problem is the durable state is always somewhere else. So with AWS Lambdas, AWS Lambdas makes um, Dynamo almost seem like it's integrated because they, 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 they do a lot of tricks to make, you know, Dynamo really, you know, uh, you know provide a, a tight connection to Dynamo. But if I want to use any other kind of state, like, you know, if I'm spinning up like a database connection pool, and I'm having to deal with going through that database connection pool, that state is always living outside of that function. So there's no way to really directly, you know, direct accessibility of my state, because I'm always communicating out to some external storage. So this really is limiting the options for how I kind of manage and coordinate the state. Um, and this also limits the options for modeling that my consistency guarantees. So the current view of state and how that state gets managed is really limiting not only the usefulness of the stateful functions, but it's also stateless functions, but it's also limiting my billing models. So there's, a, there's these really common themes that are limiting how serverless is being used and adopted today. So, you know, and, and really, I'd summarize it, the primary limitation is no state. So how many people write applications that never need any state? Is there anyone that has an application that never needs state? Yes. Most applications today require, oh, you have an application that requires no state. One person. <laughs> so there's, oh, two. We have two people. Two stragglers say that they have applications. So, right, the use cases where we don't need state are very limited to this, you know, the fairly limited use cases. Uh, so I think for the adoption of serverless to become, you know, widespread, we need to figure out how we get state into our server. Um, so what we need to do is we need to move from this model of stateless serverless to stateful serverless. So the general idea of what people are going trying to do is how can we abstract over our state? So if you think about abstracting over state, this is, it's a little bit of a stretch, but you can think about in Spark, like Spark collections, abstract over that state, and I don't think about the fact that that's, that state is actually across a cluster. I'm not thinking about where that state is actually being managed and stored. I'm more just operating on that state and Spark is managing that state for me underneath the covers. So I'm abstracting over that state. 
Uh, we abstract over a lot of things in compute today, right? We abstract over resources, such as, you know, with Kubernetes. I'm abstracting over, you know, compute and memory. Um, Istio service meshes abstract over our communication layer. So there's, this is a, you know, a fundamental paradigm of computing is how we abstract over these different layers to make them easier to use and, and leverage inside of our applications. And I think the future of serverless is going to be the same notion of how do we abstract over our state so that we can make it um, easily accessible inside of our stateful serverless functions. And so this leads towards um, having our state managed by a framework for us and not you know, us directly trying to manage that state, you know, doing traditional CRUD operations. So the reason um, you, traditional CRUD database models won't work is there's a number of reasons why you, I can't use like a traditional, like an Oracle or, you know, even like a Cassandra is because it, it, in a serverless world, it's very hard to manage my database connection pools, right? If I have to, you know, every time I spin up a serverless function, I have to make a connection to a database, you know, spin up a connection pool and it's a short-lived operation and it immediately shuts down. That's, that's a lot of overhead for a very short-lived function. Um, also, if I have, you know, like, you know, I'm scaling, you know, several hundred, you know, serverless functions in, you know, a, a five-second time period, and they all make a connection to the database, I'm going to cause, you know, I'm going to run out of connections. Um, the other problem is that if I have this unconstrained access to my database, if I can do, you know, any kind of CRUD operation, there's no way to automate these operations. What we'd like to go towards is in a way of how can we automate the access to the state so that the programmer doesn't have to think about it. So if we can limit the database access patterns, we can start to think about ways of abstracting over that state and making it easier to work with. Uh, so this, lead, so what this means is, right, if, if I can understand the intention of each access, so if I had a way for my serverless functions to say, hey, this is the type of state and these are the access patterns I need, you go and manage this for me, I can then start to figure out ways of optimizing this data access patterns. So the, the the frameworks could provide ways of, you know, automatically caching my data, uh, making it, you know, you know, change my consistency constraints for me, of, uh, you know, pre-caching the data that I'm going to need, um, you know, dealing with resiliency and failure for me. If I had a way of declaring the state that was needed and how I was going to access it and work with it. So to get to this model of abstracting over state, what we really need is better models for distributed state. Uh, you know, most people in the Scala community are fairly familiar with, you know, event sourcing. Event sourcing is this model of append-only logging. I, I get, a, you know, I get a series of events into my, my application and I log those events. So the traditional example is, you know, banking. I get it, you know, with banking, I, instead of keeping a running balance in a database table of, you know, this is my account balance, I'll have a log of, you know, deposit $10, deposit $10, Deposit five dollars, withdraw three dollars. I now have. You know, I can now go and replay those, you know, deposits and withdrawals, add them up, and I get to what is my final state. So I'm not maintaining the actual balance. I'm just maintaining an event of logs that have happened over time. Uh, this, the, the nice thing about this event model is that I don't have to have a, a, a like a strongly consistent database that's maintaining that balance for me. Now, the other model that I can use is CRDTs. Who here has heard of CRDTs? Anyone familiar with a couple people? Handful? All right, so I'll talk briefly about CRDTs. CRDTs are um, a really unique data model. Did I, I didn't even put in what CRDT stands for. Convergent Replicated Distributed. Call it, help me out, I'm drawing a blank. Thank you. Conflict-free replicated data types. Is that right? Yeah, okay. I, I, so CRDT, the notion of a CRDT is uh, data types that guarantee convergent to the same value in spite of network delays, partitions, and message reordering. So the, the values that converge to a single value, regardless of the order of the operations, how things are coming in, how that data is flowing through the system, I'm always going to re uh, uh, you know, uh, achieve the same, you know, like account balance, right? So if I have, you know, three deposits, four withdrawals, I'll always end up at the exact same account balance no matter how those deposits and withdrawals are applied. Um, so CRDTs provide a distinct view of data, right? They're, they're, it's much different than just like a, a dumb data store. This isn't a place, 
like a, just to dump my data in a, like a traditional database. Instead, this is more of an abstraction of my data type. So I'm thinking about my data in a very different view. So the, what the, this is, is it's more of a data structure that tells how to build the value. And so because it has intelligence in how these values get built, I can come up with new models of working with these values. Uh, so some examples of uh, convergent CRDT convergent operations. So associative, right? It doesn't matter the order the operations apply. Commutative, uh, sorry, associative is grouping doesn't matter, like how I group the operations together. Uh, commutative, order of application doesn't matter. Idempotent, duplication doesn't matter. So there's a lot of data types that match this. So you can imagine like registers, counters, there's monotonically increasing counters, uh, like scores of a baseball game, right? These type of, you know, all, you know, like time series data, I'm gathering weather data. These type of operations, I just want to, you know, come to a, a, a conclusive value, but it doesn't matter how the or operations are applied. So there's a lot of value of CRDTs in uh, distributed systems. Um, one is that they can replicate data across the network without any synchronization mechanism. So if I'm using them in a serverless function, it doesn't matter how these functions are replicating the data between the different functions because they're going to converge to the same value. And the real value is that I can avoid distributed locks, two-phase commit, this type of thing. So what I get is consistency without consensus. So traditional databases, if I were to try to, you know, use a traditional database with a, you know, a two-phase locking on a distributed system of, you know, several hundred functions, I'm going to end up with a lot of, you know, problems with deadlock. So the other primary par paradigm that's being adopted is event sourcing and stateful serverless. So event sourcing is an ideal model for serverless computing. Um, the idea, right, I talked about this, right, the event log tracks which events have been applied and what is the current state. So you can imagine that I can write my applications using event logging. So I have a series of functions that provide, you know, that are a series of community functions or associative functions. It doesn't matter exactly the order that these functions are being computed. But when I run these functions, they add up to the cumulative state that I need to get to. And what I can do is I, as I execute each of these functions, I can put it into an event log to say, you know, Function A has computed, this is the output. Function B has computed, this is the output. And at the end of that event log of my functions running, I then get to a, a, a final state. And if at any point my computation gets disrupted, you know, the, I get an outage, a, a note goes out, I can see it from a snapshot point of view of what events have been calculated, where have I processed, and where do I need to restart. And I can replay events based off of that. And so this model allows me in a stateful application to, to come up with a new paradigm for how I do the, the, the programming in that stateless application. Uh, this is Pat H H Helen. He talks about, he has a, he, he coined the term asset 2.0. Uh, there's a lot of interesting papers out there. He's written, other people have written, talking about this ashes, asset 2.0, right? So instead of uh, the traditional asset model where I'm, I'm concerned with consistency, I'm now concerned with figuring out how my operations can be associative, commutative, idempotent, and distributed. So now this, the, the caveat emperor is of all this is the fact that it depends on the shape of the data, right, and the level of consistency that's needed. So not all of my data can be fitted into CRDTs. Not everything can be, you know, uh, associative, commutative data. I should have put the uh, credits there. This is, this is from Kyle Kingsbury. He has a, a blog, he writes all about, you know, on Jepson.io about all the different levels of consistency, right? So depending on the level of consistency that I need, do I need, you know, like strict serializability or do I just need linearizability? So if I need these higher levels of consistency, these type of patterns won't apply. So it depends a lot on the business use case and on, you know, how my data and can I shape the data into these forms, right? So this isn't going to solve every single problem and I don't envision like all of, serverless will, you know, be able to, you know, everything will be able to move into the serverless model. But I, th I think there's a lot of use cases that can move towards this new model of computing. Uh, so if we look at how these, so there's a number, and I'll talk about this in just a minute. If we look across the landscape, there's a number of, of companies and, and projects that are moving towards how do we do stateful serverless 
architectures. And it's interesting to see that they're all converging on a couple of different primary paradigms. One is the actor-based model is becoming, you know, seems to be having almost like a resurgence. It's becoming fairly popular across a number of these state full serverless functions. Um, also, the workflow paradigm obviously is a very useful way of thinking about things, right? You can imagine a workflow where I have steps, you know, A through Z. At each po point of that workflow, I can checkpoint my state and have that state automatically checkpointed for me. And if I have to restart the workflow, you know, at step L, I can automatically inject into that, oh, well, you're at step L. This is the state you're going to need. So I really envision that the future of stateful is serverless. And I think this is where computing is going, is stateful serverless. And I think this is going to be this major paradigm shift over the next you know, couple of years of this transition into stateful serverless. So two examples of, of this, um, something I just learned about this week from Colin, um, is Azure durable functions, right? They're executed using the Azure function runtime. Uh, they use what's called a, a durable task framework. And they maintain their execution state via event sourcing. So they use this exact model of which functions have run. And as I run that function, store that, that function, um, the computation, the, the, the what's run into a, a durable state, like an Azure table. And then I can just replay where I need to, picking off uh, that state. Um, and then they also, and I don't quite understand this, but they, they use an actor-like programming model underneath the covers. And so they do a lot of the similar, like Microsoft has the Orleans framework. So I think that they're taking some of these paradigms of actor programming and applying them to durable functions. So this is one example of it. Uh, the other one is uh, Lightbend Cloud State. Uh, so, you know, Lightbend for a long time, you know, Auk actors have been around for a really long time. Uh, very popular, you know, programming model um, with actor persistence and clustering. What's interesting is these building blocks of Auk actors with actors persistence and clustering are being used to build uh, a stateful serverless framework. So the, and the, you, it really makes a lot of sense because they're this ideal framework for building stateful serverless functions because actor persistence, um, on top of actor persistence, there's ACA distributed data, which is essentially CRDTs underneath the covers. So you can imagine taking these type of paradigms and applying them to the cloud and cloud state. The general idea with uh, Lightbend cloud state is they have two primary models of one is event source and the other is CRDTs. And you can imagine I have a user function. That user function receives a command in. In traditional event sourcing technology, I have a, a command that comes in, an event that gets persisted. So I have the command that comes in. You can imagine a framework that when that command comes in, I also know what data is associated with that command. So the user doesn't think about that state. What they're thinking about is what data needs to flow into that function to do this command. And so that state is automatically injected into my function. And uh, as the output, I basically emit out the reply um, with the events underneath the covers that are being persisted for me. So I'm doing the computation, you know, based on these commands, and the state is automatically being persisted for me underneath the covers using this event logging model. Um, the other model that uh, Lightbend Cloud State I.O. is doing is CRDTs. And again, CRDTs fit quite nicely with this model that I receive a message in. When I receive that message in, I know what data I want, um, what state I need to work with. And so what the framework can do underneath the covers is it can automatically inject the deltas of, say, that set state into my function that's going to be needed for computa the computation. And my output can be simply the deltas of that computation. So I'm not having to do a complete CRUD operation by any means. I'm simply taking the deltas or the changes in, and I'm outputting the deltas out. So I'm, and because I'm only doing the deltas, this allows me to abstract over my state and automatically have it persistent for me by the underlying framework. So the goals with the uh, Lightbend Cloud State is, uh, and they're driving towards a, uh, like a, a, a common specification for Cloud State, which I find really is very interesting. Um, what they're driving towards is having a, a, a general programming model for cloud state where you manage the, the, the general idea is I have like in-memory durable session state across individual requests. Uh, and that gives me, you know, the idea is to have the, you know, a very low latency dynamic in-memory model. So instead of having to do a connection pool, calling out to my database, having all the overhead of latency, I'm not having to deal with all that. I basically have 
my state almost like automatically appear for me as needed. So this really reduces the latency and the overhead of dealing with state. Um, and you know, some really interesting use cases around like collaborative workspaces, leader election, counting. Uh, so kind of the, what it perpetuated this talk was I saw this tweet from Colin and then retweeted by Conrad. And at the same time I saw this tweet, I also happened to have the opportunity to talk to Jonas Boneri about cloud state IO. So, you know, kind of in the same week, I, I heard about Azure functions, I heard about cloud state, and, it, it, and I, you know, and I realized that this is really the future of computing. You know, Conrad was one of the original, you know, one of the original um, programmers on the actor, OCK actor team. Um, he, he talks about how stateful serverless is the next big thing, right? And actors are bound to take over the server landscape, full stop. And the reason is, is because they provide that ideal paradigm for stateful serverless functions. So, and then Jonas Bonaire, his quote is, the promise of stateful serverless is revolutionary and will grow to dominate the future of cloud. So, you know, what we're seeing is a lot of thought leaders are saying, you know, how the future is shaping up is serverless is going to gain foothold and it's going to transform how we do computing. We just need to figure out how we get state there. Uh, I, I'll post these slides online. There's a number of links um, that talk about the details. So the, there's other, Flink is doing a project. There's Microsoft Dapper. I don't quite understand Dapper. So there's a lot of different projects that are kind of converging on this, this direction. So thank you. A couple of minutes for questions. Any questions? Great. Well, thank you, Ryan, for a great talk. Hey, Colin, do you mind? You told me you, you envisioned a new programming model. How did you, you state it? I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Colin. I, I thought it was pro quite brilliant, but you envisioned kind of a new programming model of stateful functions, so. Well, I mean, personally, I think that the approach that Azure Durable Functions is taking will, will be the approach that most people will take. It'll look like distributed stateful actor model programming on this like substrate. So you'll just model entities like they're on the heap and you won't worry about you know where they're running and they'll maintain state, you'll be able to stream data through them, you'll be able to scale to zero. And I, I think that's an especially powerful model for especially in IoT. Like yeah. modeling entities that way is just super powerful. So it's it's, it's primarily going to be modeling stateful entities similar to an actor paradigm in the cloud. Yeah, whether those are people or transactions or orders or IoT devices, it's yeah. a pretty, yeah, pretty powerful model. Great. Thank you so much, Colin. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your lunch. See you after lunch. Thank you.